let us move on. We are taking a trip to the Cook Islands. Couldn't be more excited to have Jess Cramp joining us. She is a shark researcher. She specializes in conservation policy as well as engaging communities in the management of the oceans around where they live. So she co uh, championed a grassroots campaign that resulted in the Cook Islands Shark Sanctuary in 2012. This sanctuary exceeds uh, 770,000 square miles. She's the founder and executive director of Sharks Pacific. This nonprofit organization conducts research, outreach, and advocacy uh, throughout the Pacific Islands region. And of course, um, she's been a National Geographic explorer since 2015 when she was named an emerging explorer and recently was named a AAAS if then ambassador. So let's bring Jess in with us. Hey Jess, how you doing? Ah, I'm doing great. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for having me. I got to see Gracie's oh. talk. She was awesome. Was of great. course, of course, a fellow if then ambassador. That's right. We're all over the place. Watch out. All right. Very cool. Well, Jess, again, always great to see you. I'm going to let you take over for a little bit. We've got a few videos I'm going to play from my end. So I'm excited uh, to get into a little shark research and conservation. Sounds good. So can you guys hear me? That's hopefully a yes. My name is Jess Cramp, uh, as Joe uh, just said, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today just about what I do. So shark science and conservation, of course, you'll know that's a those version about me. Otherwise, we'd be here all day. I'm from the Poconos in Pennsylvania. I lived in a trailer park, and you're probably wondering, what the heck does that have to do with shark conservation? But the truth is, a lot of they grew up without me. I grew up without me to go to camp these things as a young person. I learned about marine science from books. That was my only exposure, but um, I had a lot of grit and determination. And so, yeah, I was able to make it happen in different ways. Um, I went to university and studied biology and chemistry. Then I became a scientist in a lab studying uh, new medicines, so researching how to find new medicines. And because I really, really wanted to be a marine biologist, I volunteered for different projects to gain skills that I needed to be a marine biologist. And then at the age of 30, I transitioned to a career in marine science. And of course, I thought I was insane. Then I started to work in science and policy because uh, without policy, you're not going to make a lot of innovation change. And now I'm about three weeks away from finishing my PhD. So that's the notes version of me. We can talk more about that later. I am calling you from the Cook Islands. So there's a red arrow here pointing to where I am, which is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And I'm on the island of Rarotonga. So uh, we are COVID free. So we're very lucky about that. So this yes, island is only to, yes. to jump in, but um, the slides aren't transitioning on our side. Um, oh, okay. Hmm. I'm wondering if we okay. can try again. Did you share the entire screen or just the application window? Just the window. Should I scare, share the whole screen? Let's try that. It could just be a product of the of the internet being a little slower. Maybe if we try the whole screen, uh, we'll get a better share. Okay. All we'll right. Try that. I Sorry can, to disrupt uh, the flow. I can. That's all right. I can try to start again. Let's see if this works. I'll make it quick. Okay. Can you see me? There we go. It's full screen now. I think we got it. Okay. So I'm going to go back one, maybe. All right. Yep. So I just, can you see me? Is that okay? Yeah, we're good. Yeah, All right. Jeff. I don't hear. Okay. Good. Sounds yep. good. So I am calling you from the Cook Islands. And this is the island of Rarotonga, where I, I live. And I have lived for the last 10 years. This island is 19 miles around and we are COVID free, as I was saying, uh, which we're very lucky, but I'm only allowed to go in a, a very small circle. But as you may notice, the internet here can be quite intermittent. So just bear with me if I sound a little robotic or if I freeze for a minute. So first, you know, we, we all have heard that I do shark research and I just want to talk to you a tiny bit about sharks. So sharks are long lived, which means, you know, they have very long lives. They're slow growing. 
uh, they're late to mature. So that means that they can be up to, you know, eight to 20 years old before they're able to reproduce. And when they do reproduce, they produce few offspring. Now, again, this isn't all sharks. This is just relative to other marine life. These are their characteristics. So this makes them especially, especially vulnerable to overfishing. So humans are overfishing some species of sharks. Um, and I know that a lot of you here have heard of shark fin soup, but I'd like to let you know that it's not just for their fins while they're being fished. They're also fished for their meat, for liver oil, for their cartilage, and for gill plates. And you're like, what, sharks have gill plates? Uh, so here we're really talking about rays. And sharks and rays are actually related, which I'll get into in just a minute. But as a result of this uh, fishing effort, or fishing pressure, pressure on them, 33% of them are threatened with extinction and about 77% of the oceanic sharks. So those are the ones that travel long distances and interact most often with fishing vessels. 77% are those are threatened. And there's been a 71% decline of these oceanic sharks in just the last 50 years. So what am I doing to help? So Joe already mentioned that in 2011 and 2012, I ran a sanctuary campaign here in the Cook Islands. But since then, I started an organization called Shark Specific, and we do research, outreach, and policy. So that's advocating for better uh, protection policies for sharks. So today, I'm just going to focus on some of the research that we do in the interest of time, and probably because the policy stuff, you'd all fall asleep. So first, I just want to let you know there's a few different types of categories that I'm going to talk about today. So we have the reef sharks. You guys are familiar with those? So you know them also close to the reef or close to shore. They don't travel as far. And we have open ocean sharks. So these are the ones that can swim right around the planet. So they swim quite long distances, as I'll show you in a bit. And then also rays. So the reason I'm talking about rays as well is that we have collision skeletons. The thing is your nose and your ears. Um, they are in the same family of sharks for that reason. So here's a, a, an example of what everyone thinks I do when I say that I do shark research. Um, and this is a product of social media and the news that um, all shark researchers uh, swim around gracefully with these magnificent animals. In fact, this is just an example of what I do on my downtime. What I really do is spend a lot of time with dead fish. So this is Emma and Charlie. They're just throwing a little tiny, tiny bits of fish in the water so that they can draw in the sharks with the scent. And also, most often, my days on the boat really look like this. So yes, that sunrise is beautiful, but it's usually quite rough and you're getting wet and rocking around a lot, which leaves my research assistants feeling a bit like this. And like this. And since we often have our work very late at night or early in the morning, they find very, very interesting places to sleep. So this is Emma asleep on top of the bait cooler. Okay, so let's get into research. This is actually one of my very favorite photos. This is a photo of my team actually doing research uh, amongst a bunch of black sharks in Penryn. Okay, so one of the techniques that I use to study the on the reef, what species are there and about how many. They're called baited remote underwater video stations. Basically, it's a GoPro camera inside a housing. This is a bunch of crushed fish, which lets off uh, a bait, and then the sharks really smell it them on the camera. I have those recording on the bottom. And of course, first, before we get going, uh, we have to spend more time with bait. So you're going to hear a common theme throughout my talk, and that's bait, bait, bait. Um, so what I'm trying to hope here is that um, this is work, but it is fantastic and exciting. So this is Aya. She's, uh, well, she's now nine years old, but she was at the time and was able to help me conduct some of this research. And then once bait put into the canister, we then can deploy these over the side of And then we're going to do a bit what that process and the footage looks like with the first video. So something else we're doing here, we're dropping cameras all along your reef so that we can get an understanding of which sharks are here, how big they are, and about how many. This is called a baited remote underwater video, or bro. Can you guys say bro? Bro. So would anyone like to see what the footage looks like?
and see oh, we catch up. Um, but I'm going to talk you through some of the little, just little bits of science that I pull out of that. Okay, so when I look at those videos, what I'm actually looking for is the maximum number of animals in any one frame at any Anytime. So if you were to screenshot your video, so for example, uh, here I took a screenshot and in this frame there were two sharks. I'm sure you can count that and see that just fine. But in some videos, there's actually quite a lot of sharks. So in this one, um, if you were to count and try to guess, I want you to try that. I'm going to give you five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Well, so the in this video is actually one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 14. So the maximum number of is information that I can capture. I can see the visibility. I can look at the coral cover. I can also see what other species are in the frame or maybe interacting with the bait, but also the shark. So we're going to show another video. So one of my very favorite is actually seeing how the octopus acted when the shark came around. So this is actually really, really cool information for us as scientists because we get to see what the animals are doing when we are not in the water. Time to share my screen again. We'll just give it. Okay, so one of the other techniques in my research to try to help the sharks is to understand where they're going. And this is important because we had mentioned that the Cook Islands are a shark sanctuary. So I know this looks like a crazy map of lines of the Cook Islands, uh, what they call exclusive economic zone. So think of this as their country border. But because it's an oceanic state or an island state, their border is all ocean. And so we can't actually put a fence up and say, hey, sharks, you have to stay in this area. So what I do is I actually try to track the animal, not I try, I track the animal movements to see where they're going inside and outside of these watery boundaries. And why this matters is because while the sharks may have protections inside of this black line, actually when they get out here on the high seas, there are no protections. But if they were to go over here into French Polynesia and hang out with, with Tahiti, then they would have protections because there are also similar protections in the percentage of their time. And actually the amount of, uh, of, of space that they cover is uh, covered in that protected area. So again, a lot of bait involved. So if I'm not chopping bait, I'm deploying bait or cleaning up bait canisters. So I often smell like fish and I'm covered in grime. That is all right. So as, as I had mentioned, a lot of time our work is at night or sometimes it's raining. So this is us deploying a long line. So we can deploy several baited hooks at one time. So this will sit in the water for up to 12 hours. We'll check it every single hour to see if we've got an animal. So this is a silky shark that we caught. It's uh, pretty exciting when we catch something at night because we know we have an animal on, but we actually have no idea what it is till we get it kind of close to the boat. As opposed to this type of fish, which is actually just a single hook from a I can actually see through the water, as you can see, we're lucky enough to have very clear water here to see that this is in fact a silky shark. And then once we catch the animal, we then have to bring it to the side of the boat so that we can begin our work on it. 
And then once we get it near the boat, we have to uh, put it on it. So it's a bit like, it can be a little bit uh, hairy. So Marino or Tere'i there, uh, Tere'i has to hold on, like quite, this is a quite a big, strong shark. And Marino has to watch his eyes just to make sure he doesn't get smacked in the face with a tail. And then we, so this is actually a stress response, which causes the animal to relax. And so once it's relaxed, we can then turn it inside up so that it's in its uh, correct position. And then we begin our work. To look at those movement patterns over the, the broad scale, we'll do two types of tags. The first is identification tag number. We'll record in our notebook. This tag was deployed at this GPS location. It was this species and it was this size. But our hope is that if a fisherman were to catch it, it may send us that information back. Even if it just sent us the tag number, that would let us know something about the animal. Then we also they uh, get inserted into the back of the shark near the dorsal fin, and they are pre-programmed to pop off at specific times. So this tag in particular was pre-programmed to pop off in six months. And so then that tag will pop off. It has an antenna here, which will transmit all the movement information to a satellite, and then I'm able to download it and map where the shark had gone. So here's an example of where the fin tag goes. And this is so that um, it's nice and easy to see if a diver were to miraculously see one of these pelagic animals, they could take a photo and we'd likely be able to, um, to see the tag number. So once we've uh, inserted the tags, then we measure the animal. So we always do the tags first because if the hook were to break or if the shark were to get loose, at least we have got our device out that allows us to collect the data that we really need, which is that movement data. So what I'm doing here is I'm just uh, all the way to the snout of the shark and then all the way to the tip of the tail and take a small thin clip for a DNA sample. So then we actually remove the hook and then we set the shark free. So one of the reasons I'm so excited is because oceanic white tip sharks are critically endangered. And that means there's just not that many of them in the waters. And so I can go weeks without finding a shark, which is So you can imagine spending 12 hours on a boat in those conditions coming up day after day after day with no end. So, but the truth is some real data will find the animals. So oceanic white tips and silkies. So I distance that these guys traveled. Sharks traveled over 10,000 miles, so 16 and a half thousand kilometers in a and they are quite the runners. Then we have the maximum distance one of these guys traveled was 6,800 kilometers, so 4,200 miles in 180 days. And then the sharks didn't travel quite as far, but still we set a, a new record for silky shark track length, so by almost 1,000 kilometers, so 5,600 kilometers in 159 days. I'm able to take these data and then calculate proportions inside and outside using quite a bit of uh, similar coding that Gracie was just talking about. And then I take that information and I can convey that to political leaders. So this is uh, a team of us in with the new premier of Niue. So I have projects in Niue in the Cook Islands right now. And so while I talked a lot about how my job can be quite uh, disgusting and dirty and uh, maybe not all that exciting at times, then there are other times when you do get it and, um, and I'm able to share that with uh, local kids. This is interested in becoming a marine biologist. Um, and she actually has a degree in marine biology. And so it's really fun to be able to share this with her. And then also we'll be out on the water for 12 hours. And sometimes like a miraculous little juvenile whale shark will pop up just to say hi. And so there are fantastic, um, I guess, side effects of being on the water for so many hours. I just want to say me sakimata, which is thank you in Cook Islands, Maori. And any questions? All right. Well, Jess, thank you for an awesome presentation. Uh, and the great work you're doing protecting sharks. You know, I love every time we connect because I can usually hear 
uh, a rooster in the background. Now, there's one <laughs> speaker who's had that, and that was Sylvia Earle. So apparently she's got a rooster named Michelangelo, and he's we've heard him in the background sometimes too. So you're in good company with the, the roosters calling in the background. I'll take it. All right, very cool. Well, let's grab a couple of questions from the chat. Um, the first one here, this is a good one. Um, when you, you know, uh, Savannah's tuning in and, you know, knows that there's, um, you know, an industry where you feed sharks to get them to come close at tourism. Um, do you think that baiting the sharks, uh, does that have any negative effect, do you think, using bait to draw the sharks in where you want them? Yeah, so I just first want to say that I know... Jo, has Carly given her presentation yet? Because uh, Carly's uh, actually going to... Carly talked yesterday about nurse sharks, yeah. Okay, because I know that she was going to touch on um, on the effects of this. So this is actually quite a contentious subject. And um, the truth is what we try to do is to put as little impact on the sharks in their natural environment as possible. Now, um, for research purposes, I know that sometimes if I try to tell a tourism operator that they shouldn't go out and bait sharks for people to enjoy, that that might seem a little bit um, hypocritical when I'm baiting sharks to try to uh, capture them on my footage or uh, to put tags in them. But the truth is that anything that we do that um, that affects our natural habitat or behavior is actually not great. So the, the least amount of impact that you can have is actually just to go underwater and to just view them as they are in their habitat. So I prefer that. And even when I go diving with animals just as a tourist, I just look, I don't touch, I don't put bait in the water. And so that would be my advice is just to just have a look. All right. Um, the tags, the satellite tags that you put uh, on the dorsal fins, are those, do they, do you retrieve them eventually? Do they release or once they're on, uh, they're there? Yeah. So the tags, uh, they do release. And because I live in a place where the islands are very, very, very far apart, um, unfortunately, no, I'm not able to retrieve those unless by some miracle they washed up on a beach. So in a place like the Bahamas, for example, um, the researchers that are doing satellite tagging there, they're often able to find their tags because there's quite a few sandbanks and everything around. And when you do find the tag, you get quite a bit more data, but unfortunately I'm not able to. Yeah, and for those who are tuning in, uh, Jess, when you put on the tag, you get a reading every time the dorsal fin breaks the surface. Is that right? So that's not actually quite right with those types of tags. There's two different types of satellite tags. There's one that is like quite a GPS tracker where when the, uh, the dorsal fin breaks the surface, it can transmit data, but you wanna reserve those for animals that actually break the surface um, a bit. And the types of tags that I use are called archival tags. So they actually, they save uh, uh, all the data. And then once the tag pops off and actually hits the surface, only at that end point do you begin to get uh, information. All right, very cool. So, you know, the work that you're doing uh, takes a lot of, of buying from the community, from, you know, being able to talk to the local fishermen um, and, you know, get out on the boats and things like that. When you first started your work, was it a process to kind of gain the trust of the of the local community? Yes, absolutely. Good question, Joe. Um, so I have lived in the community for 10 years and it was extremely important to me to ask of the community that I work in, as opposed to just flying in and out and then pretending like I knew anything about the place. Um, so yeah, so I, I would say that, of course, people have to get to know you. And then as an outsider, um, it's important that you are honest and you can gain their trust. So the fishermen in particular are, are not that excited about sharks. As, as you can imagine, sharks like to eat fish. And so at times they're competing with fishermen. And so even more, more of a hurdle is that I'm here trying to understand and protect the sharks that need it. And a lot of times fishermen would just rather see all the sharks disappear. So um, it's a two way street. I learn a lot from them about where the sharks are, what they're doing, um, when they see them. But then also um, I'm hopeful that when I share that they're important for the ecosystem that we then build a mutual trust. But um, in reality, uh, I have a lot of the fishermen actually uh, call me when they see sharks, they actually deploy tags and they're really excited now to find out where the sharks they've worked on have actually gone. Awesome. And I think that's so important. We had Shivani Bala with us this morning and she talked a little bit about what you touched on, right? Uh, parachute uh, conservation where you just kind of drop in, make some decrees and then disappear. But um, 
you know, that's that's the way that you've done it, building that trust, getting people excited, getting them their hands dirty, right? And feel part of it uh, is such a better way to go about conservation and brings but around that lasting change. Yeah, and I think most importantly is I I live here, so I'm a part of this community. I'll always be an outsider, of course, because I'm I'm not a Maori. Um, but you know, when people see me here working, they know that I'm working because I care about this place as well. You know, yeah. so it's not just like, oh, I'm telling, trying to tell you what to do. That's no, that that's that's not how I work. Awesome. Well, Jess, we've had a lot of um, college and university age students tuning in. Uh, women uh, working on their master's or their PhD. So what advice would you give to a young conservationist who's, who's excited to get out into the field uh, and start doing some field work of their own? Okay, so a young conservationist, I would say uh, do, the first thing I always say is kind of just to do a bit of a, a gut check on what skills do you have and what are you good at versus what do you need? So let's say you want to do what Gracie does and you want to be a programmer um, for conservation you would know that you need to learn how to do coding, right? And so you might take some classes to figure that out. Um, if you are interested in doing what I do, you would know that you need to spend some time on both um, and get comfortable on the water and then you know, different types of coding. So I would say um, really do a gut check and figure out like, what are you good at? What do you need to get good at? What can you learn without spending any money? Um, because that's a huge one for me. I know I, like I said, I grew up, I did not have money. I couldn't get scuba certified until I was 21 years old and could afford to do it myself. So um, I would also say, don't freak out and think you have to know how to do everything right now. There's so much you're going to learn on the job, but just come forward with your passion, with, um, with your humility and and just be open to learning and don't be afraid to reach out to people and say hey i really want to learn what you do here's what i've done on my own so they can see that you've uh, made some effort to, to try to learn on your own can i get these skills with you um a lot of a lot of us have uh, all kinds of field work that we could use uh, volunteers on um yeah so i say don't be afraid to reach out and uh and just don't be afraid to try all right good advice and i would probably guess as well if someone's thinking about shark conservation you'd advise them to start practicing cutting bait uh, yeah yeah sure yeah that's ready for that <laughs> that's exactly right so on our uh on sharkspecific.org that's our organization's website one of our research assistants wrote what it's really like to be a shark researcher because he had seen so much of the beautiful shots of people swimming with sharks uh on instagram and was pleasantly surprised when we spent a lot of time on rocking boats with our hands covered in fish. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Sometimes uh, on Instagram and social media, you only get the glamour shots. You don't always get, uh, you know, what has to, ha what's going on behind the scenes to make the the research happen. That's right. All right. So I want to share one more thing before we uh, sign off for today. I'm just popping up a banner with your Twitter and your Instagram. Just add water on both if you want to follow along, and then. Um, Jess, remind me what the one for Shark Specific is. I'll pop that one up really quick. Sharkspecific.org. Oh, the website. At, yep, at Shark Specific on Instagram and Twitter. Awesome. We, as in Shark Specific and I, are much more active on Instagram uh, than we are on Twitter. We'll get there. Up. All right, perfect. But right now, we're mostly Instagram. All right, there's Shark Specific as well. Well, Jess, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us from the Cook Islands today. Um, this is the first time we've connected and we've gone back in time instead of ahead of time. We've been grabbing a lot of people later in their days. Uh, we're gonna talk to Gladys next. It's much later for her, but we had to go back in time to talk to you today. So that's kind of cool. That's so you good. still got the Thanks day. Thanks for having me go. It's a great event. Guys. All right, Jess, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. You too.